what would you all like to hear about next? Right. So it's kind of like the attendee can push what kind of content they're going to receive next and the order in which they receive it instead of just having this agenda, this syllabus that is just boom, 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 point, point, point. Hank Powell III is an accomplished entrepreneur and industry leader, driving innovation and growth. Passionate about technology, strategy, and team empowerment. Join us as we talk. Welcome to Eventus 365, the podcast that's all about corporate events and the magic behind the scenes. I'm your host, Yannick DaCosta, and I am excited to take you on a journey through the world of corporate events. But before we dive in, let's talk about the stress of creating marketing material for your events. We all know how tough it can be when deadlines are tight and resources are limited, but guess what? YKME Visual Communications has got your back. Our design firm specializes in working with corporate event professionals just like you, and we're here to help take the stress out of creating stunning graphics for your event. Our team of expert designers can deliver custom brand compliant designs in just 12 hours. So whether you need branding, signage, marketing materials, or anything else, YKMD's got you covered. Okay, now that that's done, Let's start the show. I feel like if you're not nervous to speak, you're probably not human. I get nervous every time someone asks me a question in public and then they'll be like, but you, you don't seem nervous. You answered so well. I'm like, mm, that's, that's, that's the fake until you make it, Gene. <laughs> that's a real Gene. All right. All right. Hey, first of all, welcome to Aventus 365. Um, you. Given your experience, your extensive experience in like, the events industry. Tell me what do you believe are the most essential elements that make a corporate event successful and unforgettable in this like rapidly evolving landscape? I think first is the engagement factor. Um, that really starts as soon as an, a person walks into whatever venue, you know, management has chosen to host this event. Um, there's a certain like ease of kind of approach and ease of like settling into whatever convention you've already signed up for, paid whatever for, um, or even if it's your own company. Uh, as soon as you walk into wherever you're you're going to have this event, there has to be something that pulls you into it: the branding, the music, the uh, way you scan your badge to get right through. I think that's one part of it. Um, I think the second part. And I'm going to throw in kind of the hybrid side of these events as well um, is quality, quality of content, um, you know, just down to the basic. Is, is it is it a grainy image? Are your images focused? Um, is there a polished broadcast? Like, have we done a re have we done a test run? Have we done three of them? Is it obvious that we've only done one? Um, so I think that part, that broadcast, and that production part is the second aspect third um third you know i usually don't make it to three it's like you need one and two like third if, you, if you're going down to the third thing you probably mess up the first two um third okay. is likely who is presenting uh and the style of of their presentations it goes back to the first part being engaging but um you don't want to just spit ball content information uh you want to present get feedback and then cater that to who's, who's in the room so i think those three are probably your top three highlights of kind of having the best event possible okay got you so with your passion for like technology could you share some insights on how event professionals can leverage like the latest tech to enhance the attendee experience and like to streamline planning processes. I mean, I, I know you just went to like one, like one, two, three check, um, but like some other suggestions of like how to dive into that. Do you have like any specific tools or tech advancements? I Well, definitely in the, the hybrid realm, if you're going to have, you know, a portion of your attendees on site, another portion of them uh, tuning in from wherever they are in the world, you're going to want a platform that allows them to be just as engaged as those who are in the room. Um, so, you know, a lot of corporate teams are going to be using something like Microsoft Teams, uh, Zoom, uh, that's probably their, their corporate enterprise 
um, communication platform. You know, those have built in uh, apps where you can do a whiteboard. We can all sit down and put our ideas out. You can do polling. Um, you can do things like, you know, multiple choice questions. Um, you can even put out pictures. You can just throw up a picture and, and have people throw up a thumbs up or a heart or something. Um, but to go even further than that, um, you have different links, uh, websites, web browsers, and they'll allow you to do um, kind of like a storytelling type uh, engagement factor to say, hey, based on section A of our presentation, what would you all like to hear about next, right? So it's kind of like the attendee can push what kind of content they're going to receive next and the order in which they receive it instead of just having this agenda, this syllabus that is just boom, 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 point, point, point. I've seen that work well. It's definitely dependent upon the kind of content or or program you're having uh, because some, you know, if you're like a, you know, a surgeon's symposium, you know, it's mostly going to be, you know, we're going to go straight to the agenda. We don't need to deviate. But if you're in something more of a creative presentation or you're working with, creative directors or people who produce shows for, you know, the Emmys, they, they may want a little more control over the content that they have come uh, to engage with. Um, so I don't, I, there are specific websites. Um, I don't know if we want to give specifics, you know, nobody's. I mean, listen, I'm always down for specifics. Okay. Like, <laughs> um, people Google, but it's always nice to give them something to start with. You know? Google is definitely one of the ones. Um <laughs> But uh, we use a uh, place, uh, Epifan. Epifan, they actually have hardware, they have software tools, um, and they uh, have introduced new tools that allow you to, um, like I said, kind of bookmark your content so that if, a, if an individual wants to go from A to Z instead of going to B, they can click that. Same with Vimeo. Vimeo is offering a new uh, streaming production tool that allows you to kind of create your own flow of how you go through an event. Um, so just to name a couple, uh, I do like that um, as well as when it goes strictly to technology, like the cameras in the room, uh, your lighting in the room, um, things that make it feel like, make it feel a lot grander than just, you know, being at uh, a theater style setup, you know, with one notepad and one pen. And um, if you can do something to where you've got cameras that, will give an audience shot so that when there are questions in the room or if you have hybrid questions, if you can bring that individual onto screen so that the people in the room feel closer to everyone who's attending this event, those types of things as well help to just bring it back to like everyone's in one place, right? This is all about networking and engagement and uh, feeling as though my thought from Albuquerque is the same, has the same way as the person thought who's in the room from New York, right? Um, so when you, when you can visualize each person and see their mouths moving, right? Not just through a and a box, uh, those type of things also create more engagement in the room we've seen, I've seen. Um, and then if you can add any type of music, you know, any element of motion, um, obviously videos help as long as they provide a clear message um or aren't just out of place but anytime you can kind of disrupt the monotony of one single tone of voice um that's another thing you want to do as often as possible got it uh so kind of engaging all the senses visual auditory what about what about smell you know what i've listened to uh you know different people in the industry talk about how they are engaging with that auditory sense I haven't personally brought that into any of the events that I've been involved with. I, I mean, you're, I mean, uh, I think it's fair, right? Like, because like you, you're functioning like within the, the AV space, right? Correct. So, Correct. So but let's focus on what you do. Right. So like, as like, you know, like an AV events lead, like you're not only like hands on, but you're like, you know, the, a highly visionary guy like you lead the transformation of like event support can you paint us a picture of how that role looks on a day-to-day -day basis and how you integrate the technology that you were just recommending yeah day-to-day -day, it is you're really in high communication with your creative team 
Um, so I'm going to speak from an individual who works with like a Fortune 1000 company, and you've got multiple departments who all play a part in developing a great event. On the day to day, you are just communicating with your creative team, your and your communications team. You really want to know what the branding is looking like, what it's going to look like in the future. Comms team, you want to know what the copy is for the executives who are going to be on stage. What uh, are the um, what are the taglines in the, this quarter's approach? Uh, you know, are we are we solid on how our um, let's say our technology and our software developers are we really highlighting their new developments and is it demos are we going to be demo heavy for this next event um, are we looking at how sales has now brought us across that one billion line and is it going to be more numbers focused and um, kind of sales jargon focused and custom or external customer focused mm -hmm. and based upon those things it gives you an approach of okay what types of technology do we want to use in this next event? Of course, you're always going to have audio. You're always going to have video. You're always going to have, you know, some kind of camera. You're going to have PowerPoint or some kind of cool content, movement content. Um, but next to that, we have to figure out how the people that we are presenting to, what are they most interested in? Do they want to hear about, you know, the ins and outs of how we're using AI? And do we need to show... Uh, some type of data where it's visualized data, you know, or are we really showing kind of bar graphs, a different type of visualized data that is more common to that scope of business. So um, day to day, it's definitely talking with those two teams and then keeping an eye out for what types of software or hardware technologies can incorporate to what we're already using as an enterprise. Um, when you're already settled in a business, you, you can't just go buy new things every day, you know, the, the next hot thing, right? It's it's about making what's new coming out fit inside of the ecosystem that you're already in. And that's probably the toughest part of kind of transforming any kind of audiovisual um, production. Um, and what we've done is create a studio to where we can, you know, utilize green screen um, to where we can utilize a 20 by 20 space and still get communications out uh, across our internal customers and without having to do a live stream or without having to be live in front of people, we can get uh, stuff recorded, edited, and and put in bite-sized segments to where um, we're not using extra time trying to get ready for a show and prep for a show. Uh, we can use a dedicated block of time to kind of either put out pre-show content or uh, even cut up segments that we deliver after we do a live event. Um, so it's it's a combination of those things, yeah. Let me um let me pull back a little bit. Like you you also like facilitate and support live events across like all of the office locations globally. Like how do you ensure that there's continuity and uniformity of the experience in those different locations. Are there like specific challenges or benefits in like coordinating setups in different parts of the world? Like, is this green screen setup a big part of it? Like, is that kind of like feeding that content to those different areas? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So the green screen does help with the studio recording does help with that because we can do any kind of content that we want to show in any of our global offices. Once it's cut and edited, uh, our AV team can deploy that to all digital signage, uh, anything that's attached to our network, um, no matter where an office is globally, that helps us get you know proper communications um, out across the board. Um, but it is... Well, as you mentioned, communication is kind of like, like, it was like, kind of like sparked something for me, like, communication plays a really significant part of your role, especially like when you're working with like these different departments, right? Um, yeah. Whether it's locally or globally, like, how do you coordinate and ensure effective communication between like different stakeholders, like event planners, vendors, or like, you know, facility managers, like, could you share an example where your communication strategy played like a key role in the success of an event? Um, let's see. So I am entirely focused on once the strategy is brought to me, 
to make sure that technically and creatively we can do a stream or produce content that caters to what was brought to me from facilities or what was brought to me from communication. So uh, directly um, kind of manipulating that communications plan is not a direct responsibility of mine, but when they come to me with ideas, when facility says, you know, we only want two floors of our London office to get this information because it's only those two floors that deal with, uh, you know, security that deal with um, administration, administration, right? If we only want to focus on a certain, you know, demographic of our business, they bring those, that dialogue to me. And then I make sure that the content we create only is seen by the different segments of the business that they're trying to advertise to. Um, so really it's just my goal to understand who they're trying to communicate with. And then on the technical side, I make sure that we get that information and that it gets just to those people. Cause we don't need to tell, you know, our, our product engineers about, uh, you know, there are no deliveries being accepted from this day to this day. You know what I mean? This, that's a small, uh, a example of the type of communications that go out but uh it's it's really up to me to kind of like pick, pick holes in whatever they bring to me if i think you know it's we need to take a different approach uh but the entire approach really does come down from the, that communications or that 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 product engineering team or our, our you know our c-suite speakers i actually wanted to tie it back to like events whether they're virtual or live okay like when we're talking about how you're communicating with those internal stakeholders to execute their vision right like what does that look like okay uh and so their vision again it's normally going to go uh to community to our comms team um so i will interface with our director of communications, and she'll already have the information coming to me. Hey, this event is going to be about uh, our our finances and our earnings for Q2. The major stakeholders in uh, when it comes to our earnings is going to be uh, sales, chief revenue officer, chief finance officer, and and those departments that that kind of whittle down from there. Um, with this, maybe we also want to you know do something fun and highlight you know, the, the pets of our CRO, our CFO. Um, and so, you know, what kind of ideas do you have where we can kind of throw in something engaging where we highlight our, highlight their, their pets, they tell a quick story, but then we get right, like we human, we humanize our employees, right? Our directors, right? But then get back to the information at hand. Um, so really with me and then we'll just, again, kind of have that brainstorming session um, to where, you know, does it make sense to humanize them this way? Should we really talk about something that's kind of more so going on right now in the world? Um, are we just throwing pets out there because it's cute, right? Uh, so like thinking about the entire scope of like what's happening, you know, in the macroeconomic environment, what's happening in the social environment, um, political environment, and kind of being that last voice of reason to say, okay, with all this going on and to to com complete or enhance our technical abilities, let me give you this feedback and then you can go back to your, you know, whoever is the stakeholder that you have to interface with and let them know that based on the technical opinion, this is how it'll come across. Maybe we should pivot to something else. Uh, but again, I, I really have to lean on communications team because unless I'm in a room with an exec, I am, they are the buffer between me and any other stakeholder that comes into uh, a technical production. Got it. Um, okay, so it's fascinating how you kind of like stay up to date on like, you know, the industry trends like you were sharing earlier. Can you recommend anything new and upgraded in the technology department? Yeah, I would, you know, I think everyone should, should look into um, NDI, uh, Network Device Interface. Uh, it's basically a system and it allows equipment to talk to each other strictly over uh, internet protocol. 
over IP. As we make this, this maneuver into, you know, hybrid or completely remote environments, as companies are paying employees to stay home and not travel, uh, but still get their job done. If you're in the technical field, you're used to being on site. You're used to, you know, if you're in operations, you've never heard of working remote, you know, and that was me for a long time in my career. And we're to a point now, probably 2015 is when we started to kind of see a way or see the technology allow us to, from a distance, right? Like we could have, I could have every single exec of mine sitting in uh, one of our offices in APJ, but I can be in Irvine, California, managing the audio aspect, the video aspect, and even the lighting aspect of the room that they're in from my technical hub in California. And that is the route I would push to anybody. Uh, New Tech is the company who developed NDI, who actually created NDI. So I would encourage anyone to look into their um, their hardwares, the Mini 4K or the TriCaster. If you compare those with any camera that is NDI enabled, any audio system that is Dante enabled, you're really going to give yourself or your AV team or your broadcast, your communications team, you're going to give them the flexibility to be a lot more high, produce a lot more high quality content from all over the world at a much less cost, at a much more cost effective uh, point. Because right now you're going to hire a vendor who's an APJ and they're going to come and they're going to hit you over the head for, you know, day rates. Uh, APJ. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, Asia Pacific, the Japan. So like the region of, of the continent. So I, I, I'm speaking from, I'm currently in the U S and we refer to APJ as just that region, uh, Asian Pacific, Japan region. And so I was mentioning if I have, if I have people in the company over there at one of our offices, it used to be, I couldn't control anything unless I was there. But now since we can have, you know, internet, we can have audio, visual, AV over IP, AVO, IP, AV, um, you can make sure you can over internet. Hey, I really was like, do I need to say audio visual over internet protocol? Um, but again, there are so many acronyms and yeah, but uh, that that's the, one of the biggest things right now is remote control and cloud, cloud-based uh, streaming control. And then, uh, taking advantage of the different streaming codecs, uh, right? So if you see anything on YouTube, it's probably going to be uh, H.264, another streaming protocol. Um, any of my tech geeks will, will know what I'm talking about here. But, you know, when you're streaming from a computer, I'm going from a camera right now into my laptop, right? If I was going to go from my laptop over to LinkedIn or over to YouTube or even to Instagram, some people can stream straight there. Uh, oftentimes those are different streaming calls, streaming protocols needed uh, that you would have to spit out to those different uh, end devices. So um, you're always going to want to keep that in mind because more often than not, your company or whom, what, whomever you're working with, they want to stream to socials and you're going to need a beginning software or cloud-based program that has the capability to spit out to all those socials. So always keep that in mind. Um, and, and as this remote world continues to just get larger and larger, it's crucial for us on my end to keep learning about internet protocols, keep learning about cloud storage, um, keep learning about uh, data migration um, and how fast metadata can move over these different protocols uh, because we're tied to that. And although we can't exactly control it, we need to know how to react, right? A lot of our job is troubleshooting. We need to know how to react in the event that we we see a little jitter or we lose packets. And that's when, you know, your video kind of stutters a little bit or I'm speaking and I'm saying numbers, but you only hear one and five and you've never heard two, two through three, four. So uh, those type of things we, we, we need to continue learning about. Okay, let me say one thing to your people, though. Your people, as event managers, you definitely want to at least have these words in the back of your mind, right? Because you're going to tell the person you hire, hey, I, I want to stream this and I want it to go to 
uh, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, right? And we assume, we assume, I've been an event manager before, we assume that that person says, okay, and they can get it done, right? We per- we've probably done our due diligence and seen them do it before in, uh, in the past. But as an event manager, the more technical savvy you are in terms of just what is needed to make something happen, you don't have to like break it down all the way. But if you hit your vendor with, I need HLS and SRT protocols, you will for sure know as soon as those words leave your mouth, whether they can perform that or not, you know, and that BS meter is it's, it's real, unfortunately. Um, and it is important. And I, I think it just, it helps us too. it helps us get clarity. You know, a lot of times we just, we say we want, you know, a broad range of things and we believe it can happen. But when we can, when we are specific, uh, that, that minimizes any type of chance that, we didn't make a specific request so mm. yeah okay That's correct. The global culture began, I I turned 18 in South Africa. I was fortunate enough in high school to take a missionary trip and help out some children there, teach some English, but also just kind of be a friend to uh, some individuals who lived in orphanage and also some individuals who uh, were lucky enough to have schooling. So we did a 17 day trip over there and I was able to um realize that people from so far away from one another all it takes is a little bit of communication a little bit of music and willingness to just be open and available to create that human connection um one of the first days there we're put into this auditorium all the only thing in the auditorium are as a drum set a tambourine and a keyboard. So one of one of the people who was with us hops on the drum set. One of the kids who were uh, about to uh, were going to service, they hop on the keyboard and they just start jamming. You know, um, different styles of music. But you know, as soon as he hopped on the drums, the kid that was there started playing uh, some music that was central to them. And before you know it, it's like a family reunion. We're all just doing our little two step. We're hugging and laughing and dancing. And I got a real sense of what the universal language um, of art could do uh, in terms of creating meaningful relationships. Um, and that day, I just it started to manifest, okay, what can I do to bring people closer together? Um, how can I do that through art? How can I do that through communication? How can I do that through food? Uh, the simple things that we all need and have in our own cultures. And so the global culture was born in 2000 and. 14 uh and primarily we work to educate the youth on ways they can use digital technology to create a trade um we educate people in general on ways to grow food sustainably right now our focus is on hydroponics and kind of growing vertically to utilize as little space as possible to grow as much food as possible uh, and then third is meaningful conversations. We work with the elderly um, and we work with those who have dementia. Um, and we're we're going to alter that and, and pivot into, uh, you know, Alzheimer's, but also autism. Uh, and it's a way to get to use, again, the senses. We want to have an artist there who can draw. We want to have artists there who can play music. We want to stimulate those senses, which also stimulates uh, brain function. And we give them and their families that sense of, you know, belonging and 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 community that they've been missing be, for so long, especially with our, our our dementia and Alzheimer's patients. So, threefold program, and it, it's been going well, and the sky is the limit still. 
but we look for people who, you know, who know how to grow their own food, people who know how to teach and are also technically savvy. Um, and then we also look for those who play instruments, uh, are artists and who have, uh, some kind of closeness or proximity to mental disorders and, or, or mental disabilities. <laughs> yeah you know it's 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 it was a passion project at one point you know and and it started in indiana i'm now in california so that migration of a business that entrepreneur entrepreneurial journey it's you know ebbs and flows there's highs and lows right and and it's something that will never leave me uh but it's 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 got to take a new form where i am now you know and um but as long as the mission is is clear it can take form wherever. So I appreciate you, you bringing that, bringing that to the table. You know, I think there's three, again, I'm speaking to kind of that, broadcast engineer that that technical event professional um for the managers i'm sorry these may not be the ones but again as i was saying you you still want to know the verbiage you still want to know the tech that's out there there are three one is nab uh national association of broadcasters they have a conference every year um that is my favorite second would be infocom that actually just happened i was just there a couple weeks ago in orlando uh, another event that's really hardware focused, um, you'll see all the different LED walls, all the different uh, new cameras coming out, all the different um, production tools that you use to manipulate the cameras, the images, uh, the movement. Um, you'll see all the different in-ear pieces. Uh, you'll see accessibility. Um, so I, I do like Infocom. And then I think... Uh, It okay, yep, that's the second one, Infocom. And then I the third I would say is is ISE in Barcelona. And I'm pretty sure it's always in Barcelona, but that's the integrated systems uh, of Europe conference. And that's for anyone who's really you're bringing you're bringing hardware and software into a building. But this conference also speaks on the same types of broadcast and, and hybrid and remote um, softwares and hardwares that you'll use for an event. Um, you'll probably miss out on, you know, uh, registration tools and stuff like that. But even you'll even see some of those. Have you heard of AppSpace? Okay, so uh, AppSpace is another kind of registration tool um, and also signage tool. But uh, there's even some event management uh vendors at these places but a lot of times you're going to see more of the technical side of uh the hardware and software that you would use for a live event or that you would integrate into a building thanks for hanging out with me thank you for sending the invite yeah i know my pleasure this is a good old chat and i know uh worst case Worst case scenario. And if you haven't hit me up, I will certainly break them down, spin them around. People can find me on LinkedIn, Hank Powell the uh, third. You can find me on Instagram at G-L-O-B-L-H-P. Uh, I am an audio, video, and lighting professional. Um, by trade, I'm a broadcast engineer. What that means is I help you look good on camera. I help you stream across socials across the internet and i help you upgrade your broadcast capabilities whether it's one-to-one -one or one to one and that's a wrap for this episode of eventus 365 we hope you enjoyed listening and learning something new today if you enjoyed the show please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform to help event professionals discover us don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode and sign up for our newsletter for behind the scenes content and updates on upcoming events. If you have any suggestions, 
for future topics or guests, or just want to say hello, you can reach us at info at eventus365.com. We love hearing from our listeners. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on Eventus 365.